Good evening, and we will get started in just a minute. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to your library. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this very hot day. Uh, we hope you are keeping cool, as cool as you can. My name is David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library, and it's my pleasure tonight to host our guest for a conversation in both our author talk series and also uh, a topic that is highlighted within our Repairing America series for this year. Tonight, I'm still virtual, broadcasting live from the Central Library here in Boston's Copley Square, uh, coming to you live from the old trustees room in the McKim Building. A few points to orient you to tonight's program. If you are joining us live, we are broadcasting via Zoom. And as a participant or viewer, your microphone and your video will remain off. We'll use the chat box to share some supplemental information with you throughout the program. And if you would like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A option from within Zoom. We'll take as many questions as possible a bit later in the program, due to run about 75 to 90 minutes. Tonight's bookstore partner is once again our friends at Trident Booksellers and Cafe on Newbury Street. Uh, in addition, of course, um, for books by tonight's author, we encourage you both to check out your local library in person or online, or an independent bookstore, wherever you might be. But of course, maybe Trident Booksellers is near all of us, and you can see their website on the link. The theme of Repairing America provides us with an opportunity to engage with issues facing our country, and try to bend our arc of history a little more directly towards justice for all. It also gives us the opportunity to give voice to leaders, experts, commentators, and topics, many of which may not always have been afforded such opportunities. Tonight, we're in conversation with our guest, Michael Liu, um, about his new book, Forever Struggle, Activism, Identity, and Survival in Boston's Chinatown from 1880 to 2018. Chinatown has a long history in Boston. Though little documented, it represents the city's most sustained neighborhood effort to survive during eras of hostility and urban transformation. It has been wounded and transformed, slowly ceding ground, at the same time, its residents and organizations have gained a more prominent voice over their community's fate. These and other topics we'll be exploring with Michael in a few minutes. Michael Liu is also co-author of The Snake Dance of an Asian American Activism, Community, Vision, and Power, and former senior research associate at the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. Born in Chinatown to working class parents, Liu returned to Boston after graduating from Swarthmore College in 1970, helped create social justice groups such as the Asian American Resource Workshop, the Chinese Progressive Association, 
the Boston Rainbow Coalition, and the Asian American Political Agenda Coalition. He holds a PhD in public policy from UMass Boston. Our topic tonight, of course, takes on additional relevance in an age both where our appetite for confronting systemic racism may finally be paying dividends, but also a year that saw an increase tragically and nationally in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Perhaps a little greater understanding tonight of our shared roots will help move the conversation forward. Michael, welcome to the program. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Would you open by telling us a bit about your book and uh, what got you started? Okay, uh, thank you, David, for the kind introduction. Um, I wanna thank everybody, everybody who's attending tonight for coming. I know it's hard during the heat wave. I um, also wanna thank uh, Kristen, Amanda, and the rest of the staff for, for the opportunity to talk about my book. Um, yeah, having uh, been born in Chinatown, I, I obviously had personal reasons for writing this book. But more importantly, uh, I've been a witness to, Ch to Chinatown's uh, significant but neglected role in the history of the city. Uh, Well-known histories of the city from Lawrence Kennedy to Thomas O'Connor, and even social history histories like uh, Jim Rabel's uh, people's history of the, of the new Boston, briefly mention it in the, the, the neighborhood, if at all. So uh, this is not atypical. Uh, recent events and recent news have revealed how little attention and understanding US society pays to the Asian American experience. So, and I didn't want this community nor it's, nor it's the people's story, 140 years old uh, to be ignored because I'm not quite sure what the future of Chinatown would be. So Chinese have been important actors in the, in the city and that should be recognized. Uh, the typical image is that Chinatown and its people are, are incidental actors or even worse, perpetual foreigners and permanent aliens, which is one root of the current racist violence against Asians. And Chinatown and its people are cast as passive bystanders in the river, river of US and thus our local history. So I hope my book shows that we were in the middle of the river, that we fought the current incident and at times changed its course. So uh, even more importantly with globalization, ethnic communities are establishing themselves in many places, but in cities like Boston, gentrification and outside development are pushing them out. So what Chinatown has done to survive conducting a diverse and lengthy protracted struggle can inform uh, the efforts of these other communities. So uh, to briefly summarize the book, um, there are two clear phases. The neighborhood is located in what was the South Cove area of Boston. It was landfill created to provide for the railroad industry. It also developed as a place for simple row houses, for immigrants, and also a location for the city's garment and labor industries. And as such, it intersected with well-known figures such as African-American poet Phyllis Wheatley, aviator, and settlement worker Amelia Earhart, author Cahill Gibran, and revolutionary Sun Yat-sen. But despite these notable associations, uh, this industrial working class area was not considered a desirable one. Uh, first recognized as, quote, the Chinese quarter, end quote, in 1880, hostility toward Chinese delineate this neighborhood early in its life. Uh, first slide, please. It was, this was two years before the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, second slide. The climate, this was the climax of campaigns of physical and legal violence against Chinese. 
the Chinese exclusion act would forbid Chinese immigration for 60 years, particularly uh, Chinese women, and it would deny citizenship to Chinese already here. So this would shape the early Chinatown neighborhood. It became a bachelor society where Chinese were limited to menial occupations and led to their focus on the laundry industry, cast in those times as women's work. Chinatown was dominated by its merchants and organizations based in familial and geographic roots, led by these very same business owners. They adopted a basic approach to keep your head down. Don't make trouble, just take care of Chinatown affairs and minimize outside interference. Uh, third slide. Despite several attempts to disperse the community, this strategy sustained the community in an environment of overt and severe repression during the exclusion era. However, after World War II and the 1940s, this traditional system became an obstacle to address a change in community's needs. Thus, the second phase of Chinatown's history is really a story of, of community mobilization to address these needs and to save the neighborhood. The Second World War led to the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. The US's new role as a global leader led to a series of reforms of immigration laws leading to the 1965 Hart-Seller Act. And inspired by upheavals like the civil rights movement and its successor, the Black Power Movement, Chinatown's mobilization was based upon a primarily post-war American-born generation and a post-1965 immigration flow. Uh, next slide. This is actually a mural uh, by artist Wenti Sen that used to be on the side of um, 34 Oak Street in Chinatown. It's now torn down. Um, for a larger building. Um, so for, for this mobilization, the primary antagonist was urban renewal and development uh, more generally. The contest would take place over the last 70 years of the neighborhood's history. During uh, that interim, there were many key junctures that I go through in the book, but I just wanna highlight two examples. One was the Chinese Parents Association that organized in the chaos that was the Boston busing crisis. Judge Arthur Garrity's decision to deseg desegregate Boston public schools addressed the issues of black and white students, but did not contemplate those of Chinese and Latinx students. No provision was made for them. Chinese parents, particularly mothers, were concerned for their safety of, of the elementary school children. In 1975, Chinese immigrant mothers, over, overwhelmingly garment workers and Chinese speaking began organizing, supported only by a small group of new community activists. Uh, next slide. For months, they were dismissed by the Boston School Committee and the Boston School Department and the federal courts. The traditional leaders in the community also berated them as quote, ignorant women, women, end quote, excuse me, in, in their appeal for help. In September, when the school year opened, these parents, these women organized a school boycott for Chinese students that was 90% effective. This boycott lasted for three days and drew in the Department of Justice. It only ended when the parents agreed to, uh, when the school department agreed to nearly all the demands for safety, communication, and staffing. And this campaign opened up the first uh, new approach uh, to the neighborhood. Uh, 
an, an alternative to the, to the traditional stance of, of keeping your head down. The second example occurred nearly 20 years later. After decades of expansion into Chinatown, Tufts New England Medical Center partnered with the Boston Redevelopment Authority to site a garage in Boston, in Chinatown's residential area. So this was close to Chinatown's elementary school, housing projects, health clinic, and elderly center. And so the garage proposal triggered an 18 month campaign in the 1990s. It involved a coalition of community organizations, primarily its grassroots activist groups and neighborhood residents against TNAMIC, the BRA, Mayor Thomas Menino, and even the community's neighborhood council. In a contest that dominated development issues in the city during those 18 months. Uh, next slide. This is one of the rallies around um, the proposal. In, so indicative of the evolution of Chinatown into a civic force in the city was an employment of not only protest politics, but also legal and regulatory strategies, a media campaign and political lobbying. The community organized a self-funded referendum on the garage monitored by the American Friends Service Committee that voted the garage down 1,700 to 40. It organized a citywide coalition of neighborhoods who had been fighting the, the redevelopment authority. Finally, Chinatown threatening a civil rights lawsuit under Title VIII and equal protection statutes eventually defeated the garage. And this campaign made Chinatown a citywide force among the city neighborhoods and changed how the BRA would deal with development issues in Chinatown. And since then, Chinatown's role has only become more prominent. And I just want to end by noting um, how critical the building of citywide ties and relations has been to the emergence of Chinatown in Boston. Beginning with the Mel King campaign for mayor, Mel King was the first uh, black ca candidate to reach the finals in Boston. And, uh, this campaign occurred in 1983. Chinatown has slowly emerged from establishing itself as a recognized neighborhood to being among the most active ones in the city. Next slide. Today, I think we have some of the strongest grassroots organizations, most vital social service groups, and most active self-help self -help group, self groups such as the community development corporations in the city. Unfortunately, they are working atop a geographic area fragmented by decades of devel development battles. However, I hope this history informs the city about, about what role ethnic and neighborhood communities play, how they should be valued, and what they need to be vital. So thank you all for listening. Um, thanks so much, Michael, for that great introduction. Um, I, I struck by your words early on that um, perhaps this is not um, your typical history. Um, and I, I'm wondering if, um, you know, uh, is this really a story of history or a story of activism? Um, I, well, <laughs> <laughs> it can be both, right? <laughs> yes, I think it can be both. I mean, to me, like, when you look at cities, I mean, the, the dominating force in almost all cities is development. Mm -hmm. That's where all the money is. And, um, and um, so I think that, so primarily the book, I mean, the second part of the book is about um, development and Chinatown. But I think really it, it, it brings in uh, the history of the whole, uh, the whole history of the community as a result. Right. And, and it's a history of struggle as well. You know, as, as you introduce each period or each major intervention, 
um, it's almost like uh, you know you're up against the 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 forces of of nature or government at the time in each case, and so I, I you know you mentioned um, the parking garage as one example. Are there other key successes that that you think are important to to keep in mind as we as we look at this particular um, neighborhood? Well. I think, well, you know, I think Boston Chinatown has been fortunate in the sense that it has been, has a leadership that's been willing to, to adapt. I mean, I, I looked at many other Chinatowns, most of them on the, on the Eastern United States have been wiped out. Yeah. Um, but, and, but there were, yes, there were many junctures such as during the um, administration of Ray Flynn uh, during the 1980s. Um, they, there was a case of police brutality uh, against a um, recent Chinese immigrant that it, it, it was called the, um, the Long Gong Wong case in Chinatown. I understand South Boston calls it the Frank Kelly case, but you know, after the police officer. Uh -huh. But um, so, uh, but you know, because it happened in broad daylight and so many people identify with this restaurant worker, the whole community mobilized from the traditional organizations to the grassroots organizations. And it, it you know, it led to an unprecedented, unprecedented opening up mm -hmm. of the police hearings to the public. Mm -hmm. It led to the suspension of a police officer, which as you know, is very difficult to do. And, um, and, he, and he was, uh, Long Gong Wang was originally caught, um, charged with accosting a, um, a streetwalker and he was clear of those charges. So, and that was an important juncture because it, um, it kind of legitimized protest politics and finally put, you know, put away the idea that keeping your head down is a way to solve the issues in the community because not, you know, everybody participated and people saw that it was, it was effective. Um, you, you, you made a point there about having looked at other uh, Chinatowns because uh, many of the American cities have their own or have or had yes. um, their own Chinatowns. Um, are there similarities or, or differences that we should be aware of as we look at Boston's neighborhood versus somewhere else? I think, I think later in the book, you talk about Philadelphia in particular. Right. So, yes. I mean, most, of, as I mentioned, most of the Chinatowns, I mean, there were Chinatowns like in Providence and Hartford, you know, um, and uh, DC, uh, Washington, DC. And for the most part, they, they've been wiped out, Detroit. Uh, but I think I think the Chinatowns had to be large enough, such as Boston. I mean, Boston are a large Chinatown, but it was large enough that they had a certain um, American born generation who were attached to the community. And so the similar thing happened in, in uh, Philadelphia because the problem was that, you know, under urban renewal, uh, they, the develop, the, they targeted those communities that, were, that was least, uh, that was most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I understand the African-American community refers to urban renewal as a uh, Negro removal. And so, but Chinatowns was among the, these areas that were targeted. And so when you look at the uh, placing of the highway, I mean, where Chinatowns were, a lot of times highways were placed you know, mm -hmm. through them or, or they were moved. And so, yeah, a lot of them were gone. But Philadelphia was similar and was of a, a similar size. And they also carried out a campaign to save uh, Chinatown. But it, it's a very similar situation, though I have to say that so they also struggle struggling with gentrification today, but they have a, I would say, a more compact, contiguous area than Boston Chinatown. And um, it also strikes me that uh, you know part of the analysis illustrates that this is a lower income neighborhood traditionally, um, and so. Um, you know, is at the mercy for certain periods and events of development or govern government, whether it's urban renewal or some other form. Is is that fair? Yes. Well, the um, yeah, one of the 
I think unrecognized facts is that I, I think Shirley Liang in the Boston Globe wrote, I think mon Monday or, uh, or any recently in a column that showed that study statistics, you know, which I've known from my position as researcher at, yeah. at, in the Asian American Institute that, you know, Chinatowns, uh, I mean, China, Asian poverty rates are as high as any group in, in, the, in the city. And it's been for, that way for a long time. So it, it always has been a low income community. Um, so yes, and therefore it's been vulnerable to the same in, inequities that face other low income communities. And in the case of Boston's Chinatown, um, we see a kind of a spreading out of families across the greater Boston area over time. So from my own um, listening to the community in light of uh, hopefully the library, we'll talk about the library in a few minutes, but um, it, it, it feels that Boston's Chinatown has symbolic and meaningful value for families that now live in other parts of the region um, as opposed to living in Chinatown itself. Yes, I, yes, I think absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, one reason why Boston Chinatown has been able to struggle as long as it has is that a lot of people who used to live in Chinatown and who remem remember it as a family community uh, still participate and, and contribute to, to you know, fighting for it to survive. So that's been very important. So it's it's not only a neighborhood, but it's a center for the for the at least for the the working sector of the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a you know a later flow of Chinese immigration who settled in the suburbs who are who are mm -hmm. you know higher income professionals and they're not as attached to Chinatown, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could take us back to some of the early history, and then I want to look at the, the 20th century. Um, one of the things that, that both you spoke about in your introduction, but that was clear to me when we're looking at, in the book at the, say, the 1890s, um, the, that Chinatown itself is almost not mentioned um, in studies of the cities or neighborhoods. Um, I think there's a phrase that, well, it's really all about the Irish and the Italians at that point in time. Um, so there's an invisibility that I think you're highlighting to um, the, 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 the Chinatown community and neighborhood. Yes, I, yes, I think, well, I, I was, you know, as I said in my remarks, I think that it's actually not particular to Chinatown as it is particular to Asian Americans. So that, mm -hmm. so that, it, yes, and I think that, um, that among Boston neighborhoods, that Chinatown does have a remarkable history. Like, you know, it has continued to struggle all these decades, mm -hmm. these 140 years. And, and I don't think that's something that is, is well recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there is an invisibility. And part of it is understandable because other than the business district, I think it's, you know, it's hard to find residential Chinatown because you have to mm -hmm. walk through or past uh, Tufts Medical Center uh, today, yes. Right, you're at the, the Harvard Street, Tyler Street area, uh, right. you know, and, and uh, really small little street. I mean, actually in the, in I think you begin with a, with a walking tour and you, you end with a walking tour in the book that, that actually brings the sense of the neighborhood to life in a way that makes it very relatable for those that uh, that are want to learn more about it and haven't lived there or don't go there frequently. So, so I, I, I think um, that's very commendable um, that you bring it. You can bring the sense of the neighborhood to life in the book. Right. Well, one person I interviewed actually told me that when he was growing up, that you know, once once you went south of of Neelan Street, which uh -huh. you know, Neelan Street on one side, Stewart Street on the other side, then you know, that's you know, that was for the Chinese because nobody will walk past there. You know, nowadays it's different, but you know, because you know, because of the ink block in the South End, people are going downtown and people walk through it all the time now. But that yeah, there used to be a time when people w were hardly aware that there was you know a neighborhood there. 
And as we were talking just before the program started, because uh, we, we both have connections to the South End, you know, the, there's the um, Chinatown side of the South End that is also a presence for Asian Americans, and that's continued for some time as well. Yes. Uh, I think for many people, the discovery of Chinatown proper really comes about through uh, the resurgent interest in it as a restaurant district. Um, but that history goes back much further. Right, right, right. I think the, <laughs> the common, I, I think the common, the most, uh, the most cited um, source of interest in Chinese food was actually because of uh, the Jewish community, because the garment district yeah. was primarily one of the owners or Jewish families. Um, they were they they were actually the first patrons of of uh, of Chinatown. That's what cited. But actually, I when I did research, there was also a phase around the turn of the century, um, the turn of the um, the twentieth century. Twentieth century, right? Yeah, that um, we did with this practice called slumming, where uh, a lot of people, including you know clergy, the lieutenant governor, the police commissioner, uh, and other prominent people would like to go to, uh, I guess it was, a, it was a Victorian thing that like to go to poor areas. And, and Chinatown was one of these places where they, you know, it was a little bit exotic, a little bit dangerous. And so they, they, they enjoyed trying to do that. And it was actually for a long, a long running play uh, um, Called the trip to Chinatown that was played in actually one of the theaters in um, in the South End, the Castle Square Castle Square Theater before there was the Castle Square House Project. Wow. Yeah. Um, fa fascinating set of interconnections that maybe we uh, we wouldn't otherwise be be aware of. Um, th there's a, also a comment in the book that as we move into the 20th century, um, that one of the reasons for you know, having a consolidated notion of Chinese identity uh, comes in the 1930s and 40s as a reaction to um, Japan's uh, movements on the global stage, which this all becomes later part of the World War II experience. Um, that was something I had, I really was, was completely unaware of before coming across this in your book, um, that that was a garnering point for, for Chinese identity um, in Chinatowns across the world. Yeah, that was very, that was a very important, um, I mean, it was unfortunate, I mean, you know, the, those events, but I mean, for um, the Chinese community, it elicited um, more empathy and, and mm -hmm. sympathy. And then the, the, you know, the war then opened up employment opportunities mm -hmm. uh, outside of Chinatown for a lot of Chinese residents, mm -hmm. similar as it did for, you know, I think the African American community, mm -hmm. um, and so that and so that had a big impact. And then, of course, China was a ally of the United States uh, during the war, and that that actually led to the um, the drop, you know, the end of the exclusion laws uh, because the Japanese was using the fact that there was these exclu <laughs> exclusion laws. Mm -hmm. So, um, so. Yeah, it was a very important. It was a very important turning point, and plus, the war actually activated a lot of common people who previously had had um, left affairs up to the traditional leadership, and they mm. came out in the streets, solicit donations, organized boycotts, mm. and that sort of thing. Mm. Interesting. Um, as we move into the 1950s, Boston, um, this this is the period where. De the development work starts to happen in earnest. And, um, uh, you know, certainly we see the West End, Scully Square developments displacing a lot of people. And yet that then that continues across the downtown neighborhoods in particular, um, which has a devastating effect on, on parts of Chinatown. Could you talk a little bit about that? And um, are there any personal stories that you'd like to share on that topic? Yes, I think, um, yeah, the, you know, the, well, first was the highways, you know, uh, first was 
uh, the central artery. I mean, Boston at that time was struggling to kind of uh, become the city it is today. I mean, it was uh, in decline for a long time. Um, and one of the problems was traffic. So, so, um, and the solution to it was to build highways. The, uh, the other problem was that, uh, the other issue was that at that time, the federal, uh, federal government was, was promoting suburban living. And yeah. of course, pe people had to come into the city. So they didn't need highways for that. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that, you know, of course, as we mentioned, they targeted, where they put the highways targeted the low income communities. And this is famous uh, struggle in the history of Boston around the Southwest corridor. Right. Um, that was, you know, a huge struggle in, in, in the history of the city. And, and they were able to stop an interstate, which was, you know, very um, unusual. Um, so, um, so, but the, both the Central Artery and then the Massachusetts Turnpike Extension devastated the community that the, mostly it, um, it destroyed the residential area. And then including, of course, the uh, Boston Public Library reading room that we were, I mean, I was attached to when I was young, uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, to go up just to be able to, to, to read some books. This is the uh, Tyler Street location. Yes. Originally, yes. 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 And it also had, um, you know, a courtyard associate. It was in part of a courtyard and, yeah. um, you just play ball there and, and it was a great thing. But you know, the you know, the sad thing is um how you know in those days, you know, people were less sensitive. I mean, they they would I mean the authorities would come and just post a notice on, on people's houses and say you have to get out in so many days, you mm -hmm. know, and that's how much we're giving you for, for the house. And so, you know, you remember, you know, I mean, I remember playing in the rubble of of my friends' houses, you know, when I was young. So yeah, that was a difficult thing. Um, and that that continues. Um, one of the, uh, you know, we, we referenced it a little bit earlier and it certainly shows up in the book is the uh, New England Medical Center, Tufts New England Medical Center um, developments, which um, today, although as institutions, they may provide great resources, um, they're a very physical um, presence uh, that divides part of the neighborhood from itself uh, geographically. Right. Well, the, the urban renewal plan that the city um, filed was actually based upon a plan that had been drawn up um, by a uh, Tufts New England Medical Center a consultant. And it basically uh, envisioned wiping out all of residential Chinatown in order for uh, New England Medical Center to expand. But um, it was modified somewhat to, to, to keep a little strip that, that's Tyler and one side of Tyler and one side of Hudson now. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the pres it, it was so so in a way, it was the, the last of, I think, different attempts to uh, eliminate, if not eliminate, to, to discourage the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the years, it, it just took more and more of the land. It took the garment shops um, that people, people worked in, that which was important in the Chinese community because the garment shops, was the, was the only employment that offered health insurance mm -hmm. for the families. And so, uh, and plus the fact that in the beginning, TNAMIC didn't see itself as serving the uh, Chinese community, even though it was there. Because I remember part, being part of a protest uh, that, that the first protest against New England Medical Center, one of our demands was for uh, translation services so that people could access Doing a medical center, so and and they refused, and um, and they they didn't implement that for for, for many many years. Um, so yes, the and I understand the dilemma. I mean, for 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 TNM because they and they're competing with these other institutions that are expanding. They have perhaps what maybe they had land already wiped out, like in the West End for um, 
Mass General, right? Right. But um, yeah, so but they they took a lot of Chinatown. Were were several of those businesses going to disappear anyway? The garment business, or you know, because I think there are economic trends at play right. as well. Right. Um, uh, right. But perhaps it's a failure more of policy. Uh, you know, we we talk today about trying to do development without displacement, um, which is a, I think a, a good phrase and a good policy level uh, work. It's sometimes easier to say than to do, uh, but if that approach had been in place at the time, um, maybe, uh, maybe we would, would not be where we are today. Well, yes, I mean, the garment industry was in decline for a long time and that, that was why, I mean, in the later years, they actually relied on um, more recent immigrants because they, they could, you know, they could uh, pay them at, at lower rates, right? Cheaper, so, right? So they could keep, they, they, so they could survive. But I think the problem was in terms of how uh, New England Medical Center dealt with it, it was, it was a sudden change. It, it, was, it didn't allow for, you know, a transition that if you, you know, won't really, you know, wanted people to have new, new jobs or other employment, then, you know, you could prepare for it. Um, so yes, they, they bought up, um, you know, several buildings, uh, actually in secret on Neyland Street. And one day it was announced and that was 40 to 50% unemployment, uh, uh, garments, uh, industry employment in Chinatown in the, uh, in the 1980s. Yeah. Um, th there's one other uh, development b before we talk about, I think, the, 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 the more positive results, despite all the challenges, is the, the establishment of the combat zone um, uh, uh, adjacent. It, it, uh, it's something I actually hadn't, as I was saying to you earlier before we got started, I hadn't thought about its existence in, in years because it's now long gone. But, but from about, from, is it the 50s or the 70s? Um, it becomes relocated or becomes a designated zone um, for sex shops and pornography stores and um, you know everything that goes with that, um, which doesn't seem like what Boston was about in that period of time, but, but clearly it, it has an impact on, uh, on Chinatown as well. Yeah, I think it kind of um, was a, a signal about how at that time, this is during the administration of, of Kevin White okay. in the 70s, that uh, how they, you know, how how little they considered Chinatown. Uh, I mean, because the, what happened was that when they eliminate College Square, which is part of the area where um, uh, Boston City Hall is, is um, that was the red light district. And all those businesses had to go somewhere. So there were some um, in the low Washington Street area. At, but what happened when they when they initially did that was that uh, uh, prostitution and other, other adult entertainment actually spread throughout the city. Mm -hmm. So of course, neighborhoods, other neighborhoods protested and were screaming for the BRA and the city to do something. So what they decided to do was to designate only in a certain area. And that area, that area for the whole city would be then next to Chinatown is what they decided. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, so I think it indicates, you know, that it was, we weren't held in that high regard. Right, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a comment on those <laughs> businesses and that type of uh, 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 um, operation. It's more that it's a comment on how the city felt about Chinatown being able to accommodate that. Right. Well, but yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult for for kids. I mean, they would find, you know, condoms in the the, yeah. the play yard. Uh, people would be, you know, uh, engaged in their um, activities in some of the side streets, and you know, in order to get to the T station, you had to walk past all these mm -hmm. uh, shops with neon 
neon signs that were animated and you know mm -hmm. i mean it was difficult for mm -hmm. for the families so despite everything we've talked about um you're also telling a positive story about the resilience of chinatown organizations and so would you add a little character to um to the resulting you know, organizations, political strength. Um, you mentioned the alliance with Mel King and the Rainbow Coalition that emerged earlier as being a very positive development. Um, so despite all these challenges and that maybe Chinatown struggled, um, you have a positive spin on, on the result, at least for right now, up to 2018, <laughs> up to 2018, because that's where the book stops in 2018. Yes. Well, I think um, people uh, persisted uh, and continued to struggle for a long, long time. But the important thing was they adapted. And, you know, I, you know, and I obviously I was part of the post-war generation, mm -hmm. but a lot of people I know, you know, put aside their careers to lead these, lead these different groups. Um, and so that and they learn to, um, you know, adapt. And I think that Chinatown has tried every, you know, device that they, they that's a, that's available to try to save the community. And you know, everything from, as I mentioned, community development corporations to land trusts to a community master plan to you know protests to to compromise to, you know, and so Political that- Political organizations. Yeah, right, and this, right. And now they've learned, they've actually learned to exert political influence. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a very active, they're very active in, in electoral campaigns now. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, so that's helped to someone. And I, I, I think people have, uh, there are people that have, spent their lives doing it and uh, these advantages and disadvantages to that uh, that type of leadership but um, but they've been very dedicated and and they learned along the way and so that I think that today the Chinatown is they feel that it's sustained uh, that Chinatown will still exist that there's enough um, sub housing projects subsidized housing projects for the working people uh, but what form it will take and what other pressures, I mean, we, none of us know, right? We don't know what the effect of COVID is going to be in terms of downtown offices and all these different things. But uh, at least for now, uh, even though it's, it's very fragmented, you know, they feel like Chinatown is stabilized, but it's exact uh, uh, fate. It's still, I think, to be determined. Uh, we're going to take some audience questions in a few minutes. I had a couple that were submitted at registration, and I see there's a few already coming in through Q&A. Uh, if you <clears throat> do have a question for, for Michael, uh, please go ahead and add it to the Q&A, and we'll, we'll get to those in, a, in, a, in just in a, a couple of minutes. Um, so, so, Michael, the book stops in 2018, and we're, we're three years later, um, 15 months of which has been all of us dealing with... Um, uh, with this, with the pandemic, um, do you have thoughts on on the last three years that you would add to the book uh, if you were writing another epilogue at this point? Yes. Well, one thing is, I I think well, one well, I think the effects of COVID is um, the, um, the pandemic is unclear. I mean, in terms of the economic life in the community. Right. Um, and so it, that remains to be seen. I mean, some restaurants have already closed, but mm -hmm. most of them have survived. Um, but I think that overall in terms of since 2018, I think like it's becoming clear to me like that the solutions that Chinatown needs to kind of solve its basic problems is, is those for the city as a whole is this whole thing, is the whole issue about affordable housing. And so that, in a lot of ways, in order to solve things related to housing and employment, uh, China has to, I think, work 
more closely to seek like you know citywide and sometimes statewide solutions to, mm -hmm. to these things. So it's gonna be a long, you know, obviously that's a long haul, but I think that's, that, that is what it really needs because it can't, to really address these problems, it, it can't, you know, I think go by uh, parcel by parcel, which is what's happened in the past. It's the, the very Boston solution of taking one, one plot at a time um, you know, and and when, when we plan, we plan well, but we plan for really a long period of time and not necessarily for the medium term that's, uh, that's perhaps needed on a neighborhood basis. Perhaps we're getting better at that. Well, I guess one issue is like, I guess like the, you know, with the Boston Planning and, De and Development um, Agency. Because agency. Yeah. Uh, in other cities, planning and development are two separate um, departments. Right, because uh, there's a question of well, there's a conflict of interest in that mm -hmm. those dual functions. Yeah, right. And while we've seen some reforms in that area, the the question remains is if that division um, is far enough, uh, keeping the the right hand and the left hand um, yes away from each other, as it were. Yes. <laughs> um, one of my colleagues asks a question about your process. Um, so the, 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 the forever struggle, your work, um, fills a vital gap in contemporary scholarship. The history of Boston's Chinatown, particularly the neighborhood's history of activism. Uh, this is part of a much larger nationwide trend in historical scholarship um, that has marginalized the stories of Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I wonder if we can drill down into the barriers encountered by researchers examining these stories. Uh, you have a personal connection to Chinatown, so maybe that made it easier. Uh, but the question really gets at whether um, there are real barriers for writers or researchers who want to get more at the, the, the local history and the history of activism in communities. So in some ways, I guess, how difficult was it to write this book? <laughs> well, I, it was very difficult, but I, I, I mean, in, um, but I, I attribute mainly to myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but I think that the general point I think is that, um, I think that Boston does need more history similar to this because, I know, for example, there is not a history of the Latinx community in Boston. Mm. There is no history of the LGBTQ mm. community in Boston. And the history, the history of the African American community is the, the one that Mel King wrote, right. which is not an academic book, but and also stops at a, you know, um, I think in the 70s. Anyway, it's it, it needs to be it needs to be additional history. So I think now there's a great interest at, mm -hmm. uh, among publishers in, in those issues. I would say probably previously um, they hadn't been an interest. So I think it's more I would encourage people to try to write them, uh, write, write these histories. And I think that probably has to start with recording new oral histories, doing interviews, looking for per people's personal papers and records, um, more so than going to either the library or uh, you know, a university and expecting to find the records there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dave. <laughs> I, I guess I understand the intent of the question more. For, yeah. for me, it was, it was not, it was more, it wasn't difficult, but exactly that you have to go a lot more to the primary materials and to, to actors in it. But for me, I, I, you know, I had participated in a lot of things um, and I was a, sort of a pack rat. So I, I kept a lot of documents. I kept, uh, I, and I kept a lot of um, materials from, from all those activities. Mm -hmm. But yes, the interviews were, were crucial because mm -hmm. I think I tried to have other people speak to the history because me being participant and also the author, it was a little bit, tricky to deal with. Mm. But I tried to let other people speak, you know, describe mm. that history. 
Um, did you have barriers that you hit? Did anyone turn you down, didn't want to talk to you for the book? Um, well, uh, um, there was, I think there was some difficulty in that uh, because I was so active mm -hmm. that some people who were on the other side, you know, wouldn't want to talk to me. Um, and as far as, you know, publishers, um, uh, I, I was, yes, there was um, publishers that turned me down, but then it was others that, I mean, uh, so UMass Press actually uh, was very receptive from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky, lucky in that sense. Yeah. I think they had started a series where the book filled the gap, so oh. yeah. Good. Um, well, one of the beauties of the strengths of Chinatown is uh, people get so engaged in an issue, you you will see people emerge on two entirely separate sides of the same issue and be equally passionate about it. So uh, I think that's that's simply a fact that uh, that is the product of so many years of activism and struggle. Well, one thing I point out in the book is that, I mean, one of the strengths of Chinatown is that it is, it is highly organized compared to other neighborhoods that Chinatown is about 25 square blocks. And I mm -hmm. mentioned that it has, when I did a survey, there was 75 organizations. So there was three organizations per block in Chinatown. So I don't think, and I've, you know, worked in other communities and I, I don't think there's anything close to that in, in, in other areas. So yes, there was many sides to every issue. Right. <laughs> Which we can never actually quantify the, um, the, the strengths of, the learned behavior of uh, many years of struggle, um, albeit in uh, in the face of adversity. Um, so here's a question. I I'm going to ask it to you. It could equally be for me. But um, but um, how do you see the Boston Public Library playing an active and positive role in preserving and uplifting Chinatown's community? Um, this, in part, this goes to. Uh, you know, what we talked about earlier is the loss of the library on Tyler Street in 1956. And, but really the last 10 to 20 years that are, uh, I believe, um, moving us closer to, to, you know, clearly we have the uh, temporary space at the China Trade Center building that'll reopen um, along with all our other branches next Monday. But we have this commitment from the library and the city to bring back a permanent branch. So that's that's part of the, the narrative of this question, but but there may be more, more broader answer that, that you'd like to give. It's uh, the library playing an active and positive role in preserving and uplifting Chinatown's community. Um, well, I just have to say that I think my stuff, myself as well as many, many other people in Chinatown uh, are really looking forward to, you know, um, a, a Chinatown branch. I think it, it first, uh, I think I mentioned to you that Chinatown <laughs> is one constituency where people still read a lot. Yes. Um, though I know the library libraries today do much more than provide, you know, books and other stuff, other material, reading material. Uh, but I think that also will, will, will um, you know, kind of legitimize, I think, contri contribute to legitimizing Chinatown at, as a neighborhood. Um, so I think that, uh, well, I'm, I'm personally looking forward to the Chinatown branch to see if I could actually donate some of my material I've, I've held. But, and I know like in New York, in New York Chinatown, the, the New York, branch there actually does hold uh, some archives of, mm -hmm. of the local um, community. I don't know if there'll be, be room. I know these money issues involved in it. There was money issues and why it wasn't a branch, you know, earlier. Yeah. Uh, but um, I think if it's able to do that, um, you know, that, that would be a great, uh, you know, that would be, uh, you know, a great contribution. I think, and I think the Chicago one, which is relatively new, um, also is is similar. Another beautiful building in in their Chinatown. Um, so we'll see when we get to design. Um, I, I'm looking forward to that myself. Hopefully, not too much longer. 
Um, let me take a couple of other questions that have come in uh, from, from the audience. Um, as a broad question, Michael, um, what challenges are, is Boston Chinatown facing today? Um, I think part of that is the, uh, we don't know what's coming next in terms of development challenges. And part of that is clearly the after effects of, uh, of, of COVID-19 and uh, its impacts on the economy. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I end the book by saying I'm, I'm uncertain, or well, actually I said it that about what eventually going to happen in the Chinatown. I mean, the whole, it's, um, well, still it faces the same, it seems to face the same pressures. I mean, there's, you know, for example, there's some pending proposals for like three hotels or, or so in, for Chinatown. Mm. Not not big ones, but you know smaller ones. But still, um, for a while there was um, you know a hundred Airbnbs in Chinatown. You know before mm. that the legislation was passed. Mm. So this still because of its central location, mm. uh, it's a desirable area. I mean the housing stock is really not nothing to to you know to uh, to admire, but. Mm. Um, but the location is great. So I think it's still subject to, to a lot of these gentrification pressures. So we have, you know, been doing things like trying to start, you know, uh, community land trust. We have very active community de development corporations, mm. but there's very little land left in Chinatown. Uh, there's like, I mean, the handful of, there's a handful of parcels that you can discuss what's going to happen to them. Actually, I think one of them is, uh, discusses the possible permanent home of the Boston Public Library. Um, so, you know, it's still the same. And then the community has changed from um, being a family community. Mm -hmm. It's much more dominated by uh, seniors now, Yeah. Um, but it still has its, its, its organizations. So um, I think, these pressures and it's uncertain. <laughs> That's the best I could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very honest. Um, the next one goes back to maybe looking over the last several decades. Uh, could you speak to the alliances between Asian and Black communities in times of social struggle in Boston? Well, I have to say for, for me personally, you know, the most optimistic environment I, I've been in um, was actually um, when I participate in the in the Mel King campaign yeah. for mayor. Of course. And because you know he he, <laughs> I mean it was kind of a uh, I don't know a random structure that there were all these constituency groups, but you could see yourself as part, and you know we were part of the uh, the Asian. Um, constituency group from, from Mel King. But you know, you could see yourself as part of this, this um, alongside, you know, the African American and Latinx and and LGBTQ and as well as the neighborhoods, Jamaica Plain and the Fenway. And mm -hmm. so so it really was in it gave a sense that um, you know so Mel King's campaign became uh, Called itself the Rainbow Coalition, mm -hmm. it be, you know, became a, a, a term that was adopted later by Jesse Jackson in his presidential election. So, but at that time, you know, you so you felt um, you felt, um, yeah, being accepted as part of the larger city. Right. Uh, so, I think that was very important. I think that the African American community actually plays a very significant leadership role and how things will change. I think that's <laughs> actually kind of demonstrated perhaps in the current may mayoral race, but, um, and so, uh, but I th I'm a little bit concerned because I think a lot of the organizations that, uh, and so China over the years has worked closely up to a certain point um, with the African-American community, there was a a lot, there was a agreement between Chinatown and Roxbury about the replacement for the orange line. The orange line used to be overhead, mm -hmm. and it was, and then so 
this eventually became the silver line. Actually, this this alliance was opposed to the, the silver line. They wanted a actual subway. Subway. Right. And so so there was alliance around that. Um, and there's been many other uh, instances where you know people have supported each other. Um, but I'm a little bit concerned today. I, I a lot of the I don't see as many neighbor neighborhood organizations in the, in those in the African American and even the the Latinx uh, neighborhoods as, as I used to. So I, I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, how it is as far as working together. It, one would ask the question if that level of coalition building is possible today, because it feels more fragmented for some reason. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you why I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not that kind of expert. Yeah, those type of questions I I defer now to some of the younger people I know. Uh, actually, I, I participated in a rally. This is just an example. I participated in a rally against uh, the racist violence against Asians uh -huh. recently. But I le later learned the next day that there was three other rallies for the same thing in the mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. And it seems like everybody feels like they can self-organize a rally, mm -hmm. whereas in the past you would feel, feel the need to work together. So right. maybe that's part of the maybe times. it's maybe that's better. <laughs> uh, maybe it's better. History will tell us. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, this actually uh, leads into the next question that's lined up. Um, th this attendee asks: Do do you feel the anti-racist movements today, uh, including the hashtag stop Asian hate campaign, do these help highlight issues in Chinatown specifically? Um, well, I think it highlights those issues. I mean, a lot of the incidents that have occurred have happened in, in Chinatowns mm -hmm. uh, where people have been attacked. So, but, but I think it more like it highlights the general situation experience of Asian Americans. So as part of Chinatown as part of that experience, I think, you know, is included. But I wouldn't say it so much specifically highlights Chinatown. Yeah, it more more brings attention to the systemic racism and individual acts of racism, regardless of who they're against. Although each community by race there's a particular lived experience that that needs to be be highlighted in its own regard. Right. Um, next question is a, a long one, I, I, but let me read the, the whole thing, Michael. Um, it says, um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and insights uh, about Chinatown and Boston more broadly. Um, in some ways, the story of activ activism and resistance in Chinatown that you have told seems to be more one of reaction. In other words, the activism and resistance have been born of necessity given the pressures exerted upon the neighborhood. What I'm wondering is what else beyond reacting explains the energized struggle associated with Chinatown? What have been the key factors that have given rise to the intense organizing tradition of Chinatown? Um, I'm not sure I completely... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if it's uh, also trying to get at, you know, one, like the, the, the sense of identity that emerges. We talked a little bit about that with regard to the 30s and 40s, that it's, again, I guess that's in reaction to something external. Um, but are there other factors that, that explain why um, there's an organizing tradition? Um, um... I think it goes well. I I think it goes goes back to as I mentioned, like there there was a very you know dedicated leadership in the community mm. um, okay. who you know who kept on organizing, mm. and I think that also like the post nineteen sixty five immigration had different attitudes uh -huh. about their position. Uh -huh. I mean, even though a lot of those uh, the, the post 65, you know, people went to the suburbs is also a flow of low income, or even if they were like middle, um, uh, they had, uh, 
you know, middle class jobs in Hong Kong or whatever, mm. when they came to, to the United States, they, they ended up in the restaurants and so on mm. because of language and mm. other issues. So that, um, and I, so I think they had a different view about their place in society and, and their rights. Mm. So I think that that, um, you know, that laid the basis for uh, all the organizing. Um, and I think that, uh, and people did try to be proactive in terms of, like I mentioned, we tried everything, like trying to, you know, do uh, a, a master plan and so on for the community. But the, but it turned out that the mass, a master plan is only as effective as the power you have behind it, because in, in a lot of ways, they just ask for uh, an exemption from the plan. Right. Uh, so... That's or the plan just lives on a shelf. Nice document, but, <laughs> but no one's going uh, well, right. to yeah. use it as a mandate. I mean, I think there, there are examples of strong um, cultural identity within Chinatown. I think um, yes. family is strong. There is the moment where um, the Christian evangelical um, presence emerges for at least as a church-based um, um, uh, focal point. Um, but, but I still think... Part of the question is, is you know, we we build organizing in response to a threat. I think that's the nature of of community organizing. Um, I don't know if you agree, but uh, uh, oh, I I just want to add one other thing. It's like, it goes back to what I was saying about the the organizations because yeah, uh, that Chinatown is highly organized. So even though there's a lot of infighting, like in terms of of mobilizing people, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier when people are in groups. Yeah, you know, whatever group it is, right. then in, you know you have to go find them in, in their houses and so on. Like people are already engaged in something, so right. that's a you can you can mobilize that in a different direction as opposed to having to get someone off the starting block. Right. Got it. Cool. Um, Lynn asks, I'm wondering what role the family organizations played in community activism in Chinatown and how active they are today and in what areas? I would say that, um, that they played a less and less uh, important role. Mm -hmm. I think they're important for the families. I mean, the functions they used to provide, you know, which is, you know, was uh, uh, in a lot of ways uh, no longer needed. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was to host people that were cut, that were immigrating yeah. and needed some place to stay or help them find a job, that sort of thing. So that's mm -hmm. been supplanted by social service organizations and, and so on. So I, I think they're still important in terms of preserving the, the culture, but as I would say that as um, civic players, mm. um, I would say that they're not that significant. Um, I know our own experience in listening to the community regarding the library activism issue. The young people have been absolutely amazing. I mean, there are some clear community leaders that are in, uh, in the mixture as well, but the, the young people have been absolutely amazing and being able to speak out with, with passion, whether it's at council hearings or community meetings and so forth. Yes. Oh, just going back to the other question is making me think. Yeah. Is, is I just want to mention that about, you know, why China is organized. I just want to say another influence has been I would say on a gender basis, the women have been much more important. Mm. Uh, and maybe it's because they're less, I don't know. I don't know if it's true. It's a stereotype that they're less materially oriented or they care more about, you know, the group. But anyway, another reason is that because in joining the garment shops, they belong to a union. Uh -huh. They were, uh, they became used to, you know, operating groups and, and, you know, coming up with union actions. And I, so I think it eventually it led to them becoming more active in a lot of the issues that, that we're talking about. Yeah. That, that, that point about unions and the labor movement in the history of the 20, 20th century in the U.S. is incredibly important 
um, for garnering support and mobilizing, particularly when it comes to economic issues and, and uh, class struggle. Yes. Yeah. Adam asks, what are some generational differences between waves of Chinese immigrants to Boston? How have struggles to save the neighborhood united generations? Uh, so are the are the recent arrivals as as active as the um, uh, your generation or the generation before? Uh, and do people work together? Um, I think, from what I understand, that um, actually with recent immigrants, it actually takes them a while to. Mm. Um, you know, feel comfortable enough to be civilly engaged, to be settled enough to be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, um, but I think like the, I think the, uh, the issue about saving Chinatown has, and providing housing uh, and jobs has, has brought people together. I mean, there's lots of disagreements about how you achieve them. Mm -hmm. I think most people, want them so that I think there, there's, there's, still a, there's still a generational divide, a significant generational divide, but I, really, I think around these issues, people are trying to overcome them. There's, um, uh, but I think we, you know, the community actually needs to have more open discussion about um, um, issues like that, you know, for example, young people now have questions about gender expression and things like mm -hmm. that, that I think that older people, old generations would have trouble understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think around the basic needs, people, you know, are united. Mm -hmm. okay. um, this next question um, talks about uh, communities of color in Boston. Um, in your opinion, are POC communities in Boston, supporting the Chinese community in general and helping to stem displacement in Chinatown in particular? Because the displa displacement question comes up in multiple uh, communities across Boston. Um, so one might assume there's um, a commonality of interest in, in, in facing this issue, um, but, um, but hence, hence we have this question. Well, I, you know, one one reason I was saying that, uh, you know, Chinatown has become more, more prominent um, in the city is that now there are these um, networks um, of neighborhood groups like um, Right to the City Alliance uh, has people from different neighborhoods. Uh, so, and there's, there's like workers um, networks. Um, and so, you know, which Chinatown plays a plays a important role in, in all these net, different networks, mm -hmm. so that people do work together uh, and you know discuss what you know how to support each other. Mm -hmm. But like I like I mentioned, I, I'm a, you know I I am concerned about you know whether or not that um, among these you know these groups that. Um, the organizations are, are sinking roots deep mm. enough into the neighborhoods, um, you know, to to move all of them. Mm. Cause when you, cause uh, you know, when you go to a lot to, you know, protests, whatever, you know, I, I do see um, for, you know, a disproportionate number of, you know, Asian faces. And it's, it's, a, it's a reflection of the fact that the Chinatown is organized. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, yeah, so I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of organizations, I don't know how deeply their roots sink into the, into the community. Well, well maybe they should check out a copy of your book to learn the wisdom of all of the struggle of the, over the years that, uh, that stems from this, for at least for those for whom this is a more newer experience. Yeah, well, it's not wisdom; it's just discussion points. <laughs> <laughs> His, history will history will tell us. Right. <laughs> um, 
there's one uh, question about one one organization in particular. Uh, do you have you did you I don't know if this is for the book or in general, but do you do you work with or have you worked with the Chinese Historical Society of New England, Chesney? I'm giving a talk in a week and a half. Ah, <laughs> excellent. Um, so we've gone through all all of the questions um, that we have queued up. We could take another one if um, someone has one. Um, but Michael, I think this is this is a great conversation. I want to thank you for for sharing um, sharing your your work with us. Um, are are you working on something else next? I'm afraid my vision is getting smaller and smaller. I was I was I've been thinking about actually doing something about my family, which has actually a very interesting history. Mm. I'm a little bit tired of, but <laughs> after this book, though. Yeah, so, take a but, break first then. <laughs> yeah. um, well, Michael, why, why don't we bring it to, to a close here? Um, is there a closing thought that you would like to um, leave us with uh, with respect to Chinatown? Either a lesson learned, I know throughout the book you take several breaks to talk about lesson learns, lessons learned from from particular periods or particular struggles. Um, just wondering if either for the next few years or based upon what you've written, you'd like to leave us with some uh, closing thoughts. Well, I think, you know, I think the main thrust of the book is the importance of, you know, people becoming active. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what's driven, you know, the, you know, the, whatever success Chinatown has had is that, you know, the the garment workers, the restaurant workers, the you know, home health aides have become engaged. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's what pushes things forward. Michael, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And thanks. now a word about some upcoming programs uh, for which we'll have a slide or two. Uh, here are the next three author talks that we want to share with you, June 22nd, June 23rd, and July 8th. And on the first of those on June 22nd, um, I'll be again moderating the conversation with the author and his work, Letters to My White Male Friends. And then just a note about a program tomorrow night. This is a two for one week, I guess. Um, I will be moderating our second Baxter lecture series with guest Paula Peters, The True Cost of Colonization, American History, from an indigenous perspective. So please join us either live on any of those dates or look for the recordings of the programs following the date in question. So until we see you in person, hopefully very soon, please be safe, be well, and thank you for joining us.